This week, we received the news that Rosalind Carter, former first lady and wife of U.S. President Jimmy Carter, has passed away at 96. Despite her old age, she was not the longest-lived first lady. Today, we will count them down. For number ten, we have to go back over 200 years to the year 1803. On September 4th of that very year, Sarah Childress was born. She would go on to marry James Polk on January 1st, 1824. James Polk would become the 11th President of the United States, serving from 1845 to 1849. Sarah was born into a prominent family in Tennessee. Coming from a wealthy family, Sarah had the chance to attend one of the few institutions for women's higher education available at that time. After her marriage to James Polk, Sarah supported his political career. She accompanied him on trips, advised him, and played an active role in his campaigns. Sarah would warn her husband, who was in fragile health all of his life, to not overwork himself. After James Polk was elected to the White House, Sarah became the eleventh First Lady of the United States. Sarah was deeply religious and refused to dance, drink, attend horse races, or visit the theater. She earned herself the nickname Sahara Sarah as she banned hard liquor at official receptions. James Polk's presidential term ended on March fourth, eighteen forty-nine. He died only three months after leaving office, having the shortest retirement of all presidents. Polk was only 53. After James's death, Sarah settled at their home, Polk Place. She took care of her grandniece Sally after the death of her niece. Sally would live with Sarah until her death in 1891. The former first lady lived mostly off of a plantation she inherited from her husband until she sold it in 1861. Sarah Polk died on August 14, 1891, at the age of 87. She was buried next to her husband at their home, Polk Place, until it was demolished in 1901. Their bodies were then reinterred at the Tennessee State Capitol. With a duration of 42 years, Sarah had the longest widowhood of any first lady. At number nine, we have Edith Kermit Caro. She was the second wife of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. Edith was born on August 6, 1861, in Norwich, Connecticut. Despite her family coming from a wealthy background, her father spent all of their money on alcohol and gambling. The lifestyle forced young Edith, her little sister, and her parents to frequently move in with their relatives. Growing up, Edith's best friend was Corinne Roosevelt. The sister of Theodore Roosevelt, the two families were neighbors, and as such, their children were educated together. Edith and Theodore shared their love for literature, and as teenagers, they fell in love. However, by August 1878, they decided to split up for unknown reasons. They became friends again by December 1879, but by this time, Theodore was engaged to Alice Hathaway Lee. This caused Edith grief, which resulted in her being cold towards Alice. Alice and Theodore were married for almost four years until she died at 22 after the birth of their only child. The grief-stricken Theodore left New York for a year and avoided seeing Edith. He, however, returned and met Edith at his sister's house. They became engaged in November 1885. The wedding followed on December second, eighteen eighty-six, in London. The couple raised Theodore's daughter from his previous marriage and would have five children of their own. In eighteen ninety-nine, Edith became the first lady of New York when Theodore was elected governor. She enjoyed her position and she supported Theodore by helping him with his correspondence. The family moved to Washington when Theodore became vice president of the United States. He suddenly became president when William McKinley was assassinated in September 1901. As first lady, she expanded the amount of social events held at the White House. It is said that Edith had great influence on Theodore. They would meet daily from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. They became the first presidential couple to travel abroad while in office. 
After leaving office, the Roosevelts traveled extensively through great parts of the world. Theodore died suddenly in 1919. After his death, Edith remained politically active. She died on September 30th, 1948, and was buried next to T.R. At number 8, we have Anna Tuttle Sims. She was the wife of William Henry Harrison, the ninth U.S. president and the one with the shortest presidential term. She was born on July 25, 1775, as the second child of her parents. Due to the outbreak of the Revolutionary War and the early death of her mother, Anna was raised by her grandparents. She received a better education than other women of her time. Anna met William while visiting her sister in Kentucky. Against the wishes of her father, she married the military officer on November 25, 1795. They firstly lived in a log cabin and would have ten children together. Anna would outlive nine of them. While William pursued his political career, Anna spent her time raising and educating their children on her own. Anna was not amused when William began to run for president in 1836 and later in 1840. Despite her objections, she supported him on his campaigns. Eventually, William won the presidential election of 1840 and was sworn in as president on March 4, 1841. Anna did not attend the inauguration as she was feeling unwell. She was the oldest woman ever to become first lady at the age of 65, a record that was only broken a few years ago when Jill Biden became first lady at 69. Anna sent the widow of her late son to Washington to be the acting first lady during her absence. While preparing to leave for the White House, news reached her that her husband died only one month into his term. Anna spent her widowhood at her former hometown, North Bend, which was founded by her father. During the Civil War, she supported the abolition of slavery and encouraged her sons to join the Union Army. After her home was destroyed during a fire, she spent her last years living with her son, John. She died on February 25, 1864, aged 88. At number 7, we have Edith Balling, the wife of U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. She was born on October 15, 1872, in Virginia. Through her father, Edith was a descendant of Pocahontas. Edith was the seventh of eleven children and was born into a slave-owning family prior to the American Civil War. She grew up surrounded by her large family. Many of them were supporters of the Confederate States of America. Edith did not receive a formal education. She was taught how to read and write by her grandmother. Edith married Norman Gold in 1896. He died unexpectedly in January 1908 and left Edith a widow. She met the also recently widowed U.S. President Woodrow Wilson in 1915. Woodrow Wilson liked Edith immediately and proposed to her shortly after. They were married that same year on December 18th. As First Lady during the First World War, she set an example of her rationing. She became the first First Lady to travel to Europe during her term. One of her trips was when she joined her husband for the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Her presence during this time amongst female royalty further helped the U.S. to be recognized as world power. Woodrow Wilson had a stroke in 1919, which left him partially paralyzed and bedridden. The true extent of his illness was hidden from the public and Edith took up much of his work. After leaving the White House in 1921, Edith cared for her husband until his death in 1924. Edith outlived him by almost 40 years, dying on December 28, 1961, on what would have been Woodrow Wilson's 105th birthday. At number 6, we have Barbara Pierce. She was the wife of U.S. President George H.W. Bush. Barbara was born on June 8, 1925, in New York City. Through her father, she was a member of the Pierce family, to which former President Franklin Pierce also belonged to. Barbara grew up in Rye, New York, and enjoyed a relatively happy childhood within a wealthy family. Barbara met her future husband, George, when she was 16 at a Christmas dance. 
They immediately liked each other and remained in contact over the next few months. The couple got engaged in 1943 while George served in the Navy during the Second World War. Barbara feared for his life when his plane was shot down in June 1944. Gladly, he was found alive and rescued. The couple married on January 6, 1945 and moved to New Haven as George attended Yale University. The couple had six children together and moved to Texas after George's graduation. Barbara fell into deep depression when her daughter Robin died of leukemia in 1953. Barbara supported her husband's political career and became second lady of the United States from 1981 to 1989. In 1989, she became the first lady of the United States after her husband was elected president. She devoted her time towards charitable work and supported people suffering from AIDS. She continued to do so even after leaving the White House in 1993. During the last 10 years of her life, Barbara suffered from several illnesses and had to undergo surgery. She died on April 17, 2018 at the age of 92. Her husband, George, died seven months later. At number five, we have Elizabeth Ann Bloomer. She was the wife of U.S. President Gerald Ford. She was born on April 8, 1918 in Chicago. She grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. At eight, she began dancing, a passion she would have for the rest of her life. She would later go on to even study dancing at Cala Travis Dance Studio. During this time, she opened her own dance studio. In 1942, Betty, as she was called throughout her life, married childhood friend William Warren. The marriage, however, was unhappy and was divorced five years later. Before the divorce was confirmed in September of 1947, Betty had already met Gerald Ford. They would go on to marry in October 1948. The couple would have four children together. Betty became second lady from 1973 to 1974. In 1974, she became first lady of the United States upon Richard Nixon's resignation. Betty is especially remembered for raising awareness for breast cancer after her own mastectomy. She was a supporter of gender equality and equal pay. She became a leader in the women's rights movement by especially supporting abortion rights. After leaving the White House, she remained active in the feminist movement. She began raising awareness of addiction after disclosing her own abuse of alcohol. Betty founded the Betty Ford Center, which provides treatment for women suffering substance abuse. Gerald Ford died in 2006 at the age of 93. She lived in fragile health for the rest of her life. Betty died on July 8, 2011 and was laid to rest in Rancho Mirish, California. Historians rate Betty Ford as one of the best first ladies ever. At number four, we have Claudia Alta Taylor, better known as Lady Bird. She was the wife of U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson. Born on December 22, 1912, Claudia soon gained herself the nickname Lady Bird for being a pretty child. After her mother died when she was only five, she was raised by her aunt. She attended high school in Jefferson, Texas and graduated in 1928. Lady Bird received a Bachelor of Arts degree in History in 1933 and one in Journalism in 1934. That same year, Lady Bird got introduced to Lyndon Johnson and they were married that same year. After three miscarriages, she gave birth to two daughters. She supported Lyndon's political career by providing him money for his campaigns. Lady Bird began her own career by purchasing a radio and television station from her inheritance money. The investment proved good and Lady Bird became the first presidential wife to become a millionaire in her own right before entering office. Lady Bird served as second lady from 1961 until the assassination of JFK in 1963. Upon Kennedy's death, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president on the Air Force One. As first lady, Lady Bird began interacting directly with Congress by employing her press secretary and making solo tours. She was the main figure of the Highway Beautification Act. 
Lyndon B. Johnson died of a heart attack only four years after leaving office. During her widowhood, Lady Bird began traveling and devoting her time towards her daughters. Together with other former first ladies, Lady Bird began using her fame to speak out against gender inequality. Her health began to fail in 1980, and in 1993, she became legally blind after a stroke. She died on July 11, 2007, at the age of 94. Lady Bird remains among the most highest-ranked first ladies ever. At number three, we have Anne Frances Robbins, better known as Nancy Reagan, wife of U.S. President Ronald Reagan. She was born on July 6, 1921, as the only child of her parents. From a young age on, she was named Nancy within the family. Her parents separated shortly after her birth and were divorced a few years later. She was raised by her uncle and aunt for six years while her mother was earning money. Her mother remarried and Nancy was legally adopted by her stepfather. She would attend Smith College where she majored in English and drama. Like her mother, Nancy became an actress starring in several movies. During her acting time, she met Ronald Reagan. They began dating and were married on March 4, 1952. The couple had two children together while Nancy became the stepmother to Ronald's two children from his previous marriage. Nancy became First Lady of the United States in 1981. At the beginning of her term, she was widely criticized for replacing the White House porcelain and accepting free designer clothes. She quickly began using her role to speak out against drug abuse. She started the Just Say No drug awareness campaign. After leaving the White House, the couple settled in their home in Bel Air. She took care of her husband who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1994. Ronald died in 2004 and was outlived by Nancy by 12 years. She died on March 6, 2016. At number two, we have Eleanor Rosalind Smith. She was the wife of U.S. President Jimmy Carter and was born on August 18, 1927. Rosalind was raised in Plains, Georgia, where she also attended high school. Later, she studied at Georgia Southwestern College. Her father died when she was 13, and so she helped her mother raise her younger siblings. Her family were friends with the Carter family, and in 1945, she began dating Jimmy Carter. Rosalind accepted Jimmy's marriage proposal. They were married on July 7, 1946, and would have four children together. Rosalind became First Lady in 1977. She used her position to raise awareness for mental health. She promoted better treatment for those illnesses and enabled better access. She supported women as well as human rights and used her voice in such topics. Even after leaving the White House in 1981, she continued to advocate mental health. Rosalind and Jimmy Carter became especially involved in the expansion of the housing organization Habitat for Humanity. She died on November 19th of this year, two days after entering hospice care, aged 96. She and Jimmy Carter had the longest presidential marriage with a duration of over 77 years. At number one, we have Elizabeth Virginia Wallace, better known as Bess Truman, wife of President Harry Truman. She was born on February 13, 1885, as the eldest of five children. As a child, she was especially interested in sports and had a reputation as a tomboy. After her father committed suicide when Bess was 18, the family moved to Colorado Springs. She would help raise her younger brothers and later studied literature and French. Bess became engaged to Harry Truman in November 1913. They had known each other since they were children but never were close friends. The couple married after the First World War in 1919. After suffering two miscarriages, their only child Margaret was born in 1924. Bess became First Lady in 1945 following the death of Franklin Roosevelt. 
She was upset when her husband became president only three months after being elected as vice president and avoided social obligations. To avoid media attention, Bess would often travel to her hometown of Independence, Missouri. She would support and advise her husband but would keep herself in the background. She was also a prominent figure during his re-election campaign but was glad when he chose not to run for a third term in 1952. The Trumans returned to their home in Independence after leaving the White House. They used their time to travel through Europe. Harry died in December 1972. After his death, she lived a quiet life, frequently being visited by her daughter and grandchildren. Bess Truman died on October 18, 1982, at the age of 97. She remains the longest-lived first and second lady of the United States.